All right, it's Friday. It's not May the 4th be with you, but Charlie Burris and his uh, May the 4th be with you t-shirt here is uh, like, I Charlie, I had to start with this because it looks like Knoxville. And then I was like, yeah. I'm dumb for thinking this is the World Fair, uh, Big Ball, whatever we call it. What is it called? Sun Sphere. It's the Sun, Sun Sphere. Sphere. Yeah, so I we, yeah, when I when I was on Swain's, uh, Jason Swain's radio show, we had a sponsor that was a t-shirt store. Uh -huh. um and this was one of the t-shirts that they made uh and it is yes the sun sphere as the death star that is amazing right. and, <laughs> yeah i i love this shirt it's it's great there you go are you a big star wars guy Ye yes and no I, I like i really loved them they were a huge part of my childhood but i did not as an adult become like a down the rabbit hole all the lore read all the books kind of guy but i i mm. mean i'm definitely i watch them all i see them all i like follow it somewhat closely when there's going to be like a new one and stuff but i'm not like a a big what would you call it? like a fanatic i mean i i am a fan but i'm not like over the top about it yeah okay also here brian baston of on the four check brian good morning sir how are you i'm doing fantastic as always i'm glad to glad to be here again it's the best part of the week absolutely got the farragut admirals hat on and not <laughs> the God. dallas cowboys as some people have incorrectly assumed the university of tennessee banner behind you I like it that you can all check out like the Star Wars uh, Knoxville shirt. You can look at the University of Tennessee. You can look at Ben Matlock all on YouTube.com slash Jason with podcast. All right there for you guys. Um, we have some Pred stuff to talk about. We still got a little bit of time before it is Pred season and we actually have games to watch. But there is still a lot to uh, lot to look at. The Atlanta Gladiators, unfortunately, are still not the uh, ECHL affiliate of the Nashville Preds, make it happen. If I need to get involved as the Atlanta Nashville intermediary, I will do so happily. Uh, very familiar with both. I can do this. I, I can handle the Southeast and bring two parties that should be together, bring them together because Ottawa Senators, Atlanta Gladiators, that doesn't make any sense. Um, Brian, what do you make of the current ECHL situation? Because Nashville does not currently have an ECHL affiliate. That's right. So um, prior to last season, uh, Nashville did announce that they were going to uh, they had an affiliation with the uh, team in the ECHL, the Florida Ever uh, Everblades, which, again, cool name for a team, I think, uh, down there in Sunrise, I believe, down in Sunrise, Florida. Um, and it went pretty well. You know, they they were extremely good this season. However, they announced about a month ago that they are they signed a contract to be. Uh, affiliate with the uh, Charlotte Checkers and the Florida Panthers, which makes a lot of sense. You know, it's a, it's it makes a ton of sense there. But leaving Nashville of one of, I believe, six or seven teams in the NHL without an ECH of, uh, ECHL affiliate, which is not really a, a, a you know, a, a thing that will you know break them as far as development, because, you know, they've got you've got AHL teams, you've got a lot of players and juniors and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of speculation. And so uh, just a few days ago, uh, the Greenville Swamp Rabbits, um, they are without a affiliate as well. And they said that they are going to be making an announcement on the 23rd about their new affiliate with the NHL and the AHL team. Um, a lot of people, and myself included, a lot of Nashville people were looking at that saying that makes a lot of sense. Greenville is like, I think, a six hour drive from Nashville. Um, you know, that would make a ton of sense. But the more and more kind of like looking into it, digging in, talking to a few people, uh, both in Milwaukee and in Nashville, uh, it doesn't. From what I, it, I'm not seeing a lot of anything actually. Looking at this, you know, I'm I'm starting to see a little bit more momentum to, you know, with them going toward with uh, St. Louis, the St. Louis Blues. Hmm. Um, I'm not. This isn't anything. I don't have any like hard information on this quite yet. Um, but it's it's sounding like this may not actually be announced for the Predators. I could be wrong, but it may not be. But it brought me to the point is, well, what are they going to do? This season, you know, obviously they can go without it and they can spread it along a few teams. Not a big deal. But I was reminded that uh, next season there'll be a new ECHL team um, and they don't even have a name for me yet. But it's the team in Athens, Georgia, right there on uh, right next to UGA, which mm. boo. But um, <laughs> it's a beautiful campus. Like I went there for a for a four week thing in the summer once. But um you know, they and because the UGA uh, club hockey team is is, you know, they're expecting to also share that that arena and everything like that. And I'm thinking that Nashville is probably going to wait until they they start playing uh, hockey for the what the 23, 24 season. And I would not be surprised if that is kind of where they send these guys, uh, because that's, you know, Milwaukee is a historical affiliate. 
but you know, having having players down there in Athens, about a three and a half hour drive or so, would probably be pretty pretty great for you know the, the National Predator Scouts and things like that. So that's kind of where I'm feeling it's going right now. I don't have again no hard info, and we'll find out on the 23rd. But I, I mean, I think that would that'd be kind of interesting. You get some a real like SEC type of hockey uh, feeling like that. You know, it's too bad you can't get the Ice Bears. You know, them being an SPHL team, but I think it's pretty exciting if it does go that way. What do you think, Charlie? Well, what my my question with this is if they don't have this affiliation for a year, if your prediction here, if, I guess if you want to call that a prediction, you're just kind of speculating there. But if that were to come to fruition to, from the ECHL, do you actually miss out on that many prospects in a year? Probably not, right? I mean, not not too many guys come up through two ranks to yeah. make it to the NHL. Uh, yeah, uh, goaltending, I think, is the biggest, usually where you see kind of a trickle down. But like, there's usually never more than guys that are on two-way contracts, like maybe three or four, I think, last year with the Everblades were guys that were from Nashville, like on Nashville contracts. It's, it's you know, you can do without. I mean, if you look back on the COVID season or the, you know, 2021 season, I believe, Milwaukee just didn't, they opted out of the AHL season because they didn't want to, they didn't think it was worth it with COVID and stuff. One of the smarter things I've seen a, a hockey team do in a while. Um, but they, you know, Nashville had an agreement that they were, you know, the Chicago Wolves, which is Carolina Hurricanes affiliate. They basically, the roster was bo- made up of players from both. Um, so they can do stuff like that, you know, with Milwaukee, they'll have it, all those guys there. And then the handful that aren't, you may just see them go to a couple of, of different, you know, minor league teams. Like I think with um, Philippe Myers, he, he was kind of traded. He was signed. He was given to loan to the Marlies, basically not even in uh, with Milwaukee he was loaned to the Marlies in Toronto and eventually Toronto got his rights, but you know, it's not going to be a huge deal. And I don't think it's going to hinder anybody's development yeah, or anything they'll, they'll... like that. The whole farm system is really fascinating to me because you have the big foreign element there too, because you have pretty pretty prominent Russian, Eastern European leagues and things like that that play into it too. I mean, you had some some of the Preds' biggest prospects that were playing in the what is the what's the Russian one? The KHL. KHL. Mm-hmm. Um, and and like you you can draw from there too, even though there's no direct affiliations. But even like something that I've always wondered is. Can you actually, this is a little off the point of what we're talking about, but it, it has a kind of funny anecdote in it. Can you ever make it from like the third level to the NHL? Does that ever happen? Because I, I asked that because uh, I interned at a company locally. I'm not going to out anybody, but I worked with a guy who's like one of the best players in the history of ice bears hockey. Hmm. Um, and I, I won't get too specific, but if you know Ice Bears hockey decently well, you probably could d- determine what I'm talking about. Um, he's like a legendary Ice Bears player. He was my boss at this job that I used to have. Uh, and he was like one of the best ever, but he never, like he was the best dude in the franchise and he never made it. He didn't even move up to the next level. I mean, is it is that league almost like recreational? But a lot of the guys who play for the Ice Bears are like, for it. like they'll they have guys that are you know Finnish and you know they come from other places to come and play in the SBHL. Does that ever happen? I like don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean a lot of guys that you know you'll see a lot of guys that come through there for you know they're coming out of maybe you know you see a lot of college guys coming out so their eligibilities come out but they're yeah. not quite you know at that level of going to the AHL yet. Um, you know you kind of will use that as a you know, if they're not, if they're not getting ice time in the AHL, then you kind of give them that last chance to go down in the ECHL and do that type of stuff. I mean, there's guys that are in the league right now, a couple of guys, I think that, that have played ECHL minutes, you know, whether that be on conditioning or early in the season, um, Akim Alou, which, you know, we've heard a lot of about his, his treatment with the hazing and all of that. Um, he, you know, he was, he played a lot of ECHL time. Um, actually it may not have been his fault that he was playing ECHL time in that case, but, um, you know, we're seeing guys like uh, I was trying to think um, uh, Louis Deming, the guy who I think I can't remember who he's the back. He used to be the backup goaltender for yeah. uh, Tampa Bay. He spent a bunch of time in, in the ECHL. And you see that a lot, too, with with goaltenders, too, because, you know, you can only have two really on your roster. And so um, that's one of the things that Nashville's a little bit concerned about now is, you know, they've got 
you know, they've got Askarov, they've got Ingram in the pipeline, they've got Vomaka, they've got, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the other the other player's name, but they've got a lot of guys, and they, you know, Vomaka did a pretty decent job last year with Milwaukee, and, uh, it, like, not with Milwaukee, but with Florida before he kind of stopped halfway through the season, and he didn't get any more minutes, and so that's kind of one problem, is what do you do with this guy that spent time at UConn in your system, has developed pretty decently well, but he has a loaded pipeline ahead of him, you know, where are you going to send this guy, so... I mean, there is time, you know, there are players who have done it, um, but by the point you've draft them and they get, they're eligible to come play in professional hockey, you kind of know, you know if this player looks like they're going to top out at the ECHL level, then you're probably just never going to see them anywhere other than training camp. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, well, we'll see what happens either way. Uh, I think the Athens spot would be cool. I think we're all in agreement. Knoxville would be the the best one. Like, mm-hmm. you know, Knoxville, I think sense, but they don't seem to want to catch that <laughs> i mean and also the tennessee club hockey team that was like the best jerseys known to man um and i purchased a, one they're amazing right like there's a lot of there's an appetite for it and uh that would be cool um but it doesn't seem like that is uh on the docket um what is on the docket is the preds prospects so when we talk about you know echl ahl khl and the future of the preds um World Juniors is a part of this. So what uh, what are we looking at in terms of prospects of the World Juniors, Brian? Yeah, so Nashville currently has three players right now in the World Juniors. Um, they have, of course, this year's first round pick, uh, Joachim Carmel. Um, he's he's from Finland. He plays in uh, La Liga there. Um, there is Anton Olsen from Sweden, uh, another guy that was drafted fairly recently. He has been out, though. He suffered an injury last week and has yet to play. The, they're slated to play today. And we still haven't heard an update on whether or not he'll be in, but he's there. And then uh, from Switzerland is uh, Simon Knack, um, who uh, is another player that, you know, keep an eye on. It's it's kind of a relatively light load, though, for for Nashville. You know, only three players this year. I know Eric, my co uh, Eric Dene over on the four check. He's our prospects. He's very happy he's not tracking eight players in, in this tournament right now because uh, he hand tracks everything. Um, but let's start out with, you know, who's who's been doing well. And let me tell you. That first round pick is looking very good. His first game, uh, Finland, uh, they played uh, Latvia, with, you know, and they beat them six to one. And in that first game, uh, Carmel had two goals and two assists, uh, three of those being primary points. Uh, I mean, just an incredible, incredible game by him. His shot is inc- it's so fast. You know, I said this when I went to development camp, but even his wrist shots are, are they just laser by and it's really impressive to see. And then. Uh, he played again yesterday against the Czech Republic. Uh, he did pick up a secondary assist and had four shots on goal. So I think now he's like third or fourth in the tournament right now in total points. Um, so, you know, he's having a, a stellar, stellar tournament. So it's great to see that. Um, and then with Anton, uh, not Anton, Simon Knack, he's been playing hard minutes, playing like 20 plus minutes in the first two games uh, against the USA, against the US yesterday and then against Sweden. So, you know, he's playing hard minutes. He's getting good results. You know, obviously you're not going to expect him to to be scoring a bunch of goals, you know, based on how he plays. But, uh, you know, you have if you're a Predators fan, you have to be happy with how Kamel is is showing up in the World Juniors this season. When do we think we're going to see him? The the first overall pick. When do we think we're actually going to see Kamel? Like, what is the timeline like for him? If you had to guess, Brian, Um, I'm going to say that. I would say at the very least, we probably wouldn't see him getting any AHL time, maybe until at least maybe the 24, maybe the 25, 26 season, I think, because this is, yeah. And that's, again, a thing, major thing for me coming over from football is like you draft this guy and then you, he's not going <laughs> to, he's not going to play a minute for you for like five or six years. Um, but, you know, it could be that he plays, I think he's got his current deal and I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's one or two more years anyways, which they can negotiate around that like we did with like you saw with ellie tolvin and, and joker in the khl but uh you know they probably will let him i mean these kids what 18 years old so you know, it's got some need some time i think to, to season over there but i mean i would expect him to be in the system in north america probably when by the time he's 2021 20, and then i don't think that he'd spend too much time in the ahl i mean he's a guy that just absolute steal and you can you're starting to see why that whole thing, that's goes to what I was saying where that <clears throat> whole farm system is so fascinating because you are looking so far ahead. It, it really is almost like how you recruit guys in college sports. Mm-hmm. You go like, oh, he's, yeah, he's only 18. He won't be ready for three, four, five years. But 
in five years, you know, that'd be, and <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's tough. Cause you want to talk about him now. That's uh, exciting. You go like, Oh, why, do, why can't he just come up now? It's right. mm-hmm. like he's doing, but this just you, like, um, this is why the minor league lo- geographic location is so important, right? Like you want, like if you can't see these guys for yeah. five to six years, then you want like your guy, like your fan base, to be able to see him if they want to see him while he's mm-hmm. coming up. So you want it to be a geographically friendly situation for your ECHL, AHL teams. Like you want like some real continuity there, geographically speaking, for this very reason, right? Yeah, I, I would love to see in a situation. Like, I mean, there's really no scenario where this would ever happen, but like a kid like him, who's, he's kind of looks like a really great prospect, like how he would look skating with an NHL team hmm. currently. Cause I, um, <clears throat> one that, one that I always think of, they have the Knoxville open golf tournament here every year. And you watch those guys, they're pros hmm. and like, they're really good. And then you see guys in the PGA, you go see PGA tour, like in Memphis, Memphis has mm. an actual PGA tour event. You see those guys and you go like, Oh, okay. I, I get it. I, I see the difference, you know, yeah. the difference between the minor leagues and the, and the pros. I, I bet it would be so stark to see. I Charlie, have you gone to a set class seven, a football game in Georgia versus just an average West versus like web football game? I've seen, I've seen it in basketball. I've seen it in okay. basketball, but not football. No. Football, as someone who grew up in the class 7A, it was 5A at the time when that was biggest and it just keeps expanding. The difference in players and scheme and body types and just skill level from watching a 7A, you're like, oh, Tennessee is kind of screwed in this regard where it's just <laughs> it's a the guys point. in Georgia. It's yeah. just a different sport almost entirely. There's a reason like I was talking to a high school coach. Uh, the other day um and he was telling me like yeah like we would love to play like some tennessee schools because like they'll sometimes go out and venture out to like vegas and play what is that the one where stallings is coming from bishop gorman um and they'll venture out and they want to do that but because it's good for the branding but they the tennessee coaches that you talked to and i'm not going to cite anybody they're like yeah i mean theoretically it'd be cool to go down to colquitt or wherever but like you don't have the bodies like we're gonna get the shit kicked out of us like it's just it's not feasible like it's it's just not fair and like in football and i'm sure in hockey is the same way where it's just the bodies are not the same and the skill level is not the same that like yeah it might be cool theoretically to watch them play each other then you watch it and you're like oh stop it like the simpsons meme where it's are they're already dead <laughs> like that's what it would be like yeah i mean it's a good example of that was development camp a couple weeks back where mm-hmm. you know we're watching these guys and i'm looking at you know like Kamel and stuff like that and you're like man some of these guys are really great skaters you could tell the the difference in like the skill level but then then i noticed luke evangelista uh, who mm-hmm. you know had been playing in the ahl had had 100 points a couple years back in juniors and just how he skated it was immediate like you i didn't have to see the number on the back of his jersey i knew immediately who it was because he was just a whole other step beyond everybody else because he's been in the system a little bit longer. He's just a different type of player. And so like, you know, his skating was just, you see a guy and you're like, he's doing pretty well. Like he's a pretty good, strong skater. And then you saw Evangelista and he makes it look effortless and his, you know, his turns are just immaculate. And you're like, Oh yeah. So then imagining these guys and getting them, you know, in training camp or something like that. And, you know, a handful of these guys come in and, and get some time in with the NHL players. I mean, I mean, are you a guy that wants to go in there and be a defenseman, uh, you know, being 19 years old to square off against Philip Forsberg in practice, or are you going to try to, uh, you know, are you going to be a, another forward and Tanner Janot is hurtling towards you and you're just like, yeah, I, no, I don't think that's, I don't think so. And so, yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely something getting used to is like, you're just not going to see these guys and trying to find, you know, streams or things like that is, is even very difficult. Absolutely. Well, we'll see what ultimately happens here. Something to keep an eye on uh, going forward. Uh, Something else to also keep in mind. Um, Now that it seems like this is going to be the roster, right, Brian? Like this is kind of where we're at. Like we have a really good feel of what this team's going to look like. Chuck is not going to be on this roster, much to the chagrin of Charlie Burris. Unfortunately, (laughs) pour one out for the almost Nashville Predator, (laughs) uh, Mr. Chuck. But um, Brian, when you look at lineups and you're thinking about what this rotation is going to look like where where are you at with this yeah and so it, i think i've got some ideas and it's not going to be surprising um i hope you guys have yours because i want to hear what yours are before you hear what i say 
Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think on the first line, um, Forsberg, Duchesne, Granlund, I think that's a no brainer. I, don't, I think that that's that's a line that performed the best by far. And I you know they did split them up on times last year to kind of spread the talent out. But the unit is just too good together, period, that you can't really there's nothing you can do. You know, it's just you got to keep those together. And then as you get to that second line, you know, one of the questions I have the second line is, yeah, Nita Ryder is going to take over for Luke Cunning. You know, hallelujah. Ryan Johansson had one of his best years, you know, in a decade um, last season. You know, he'll still be centering that second line. And then it could be Tolvin. And, you know, he did get benched towards the end of last season, but that's kind of primarily where he was playing. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe Tomasino get a shot there. Um, but I think it's going to be that, you know, that's kind of where you're going to kind of see that second line. So it's going to be Nita Ryder, Johansson, and then I'm going to still say Tolvin. Um, third line shouldn't surprise anybody. Herd line, Yakov Trenin, Colton Sissons, Tanner Janot. You don't have, that's all there is to it. Mm-hmm. And then uh, what, what they call, what we started calling the, um, uh the baby line basically last year at, at points uh that fourth line of being tomasino uh, cody glass who came over from uh from uh vegas you know in that three-way ryan ellis trade and then i'm guessing it, they, they signed john leonard from you know from san jose that came back from C- the cunning trade he may be the guy who starts there but i'm pretty sure that we're going to see tommy novak back in there because he's had a stellar stellar you know time with in, with milwaukee and he looked really good in his limited time last season so i think your forwards are going to be about what you expect uh, i don't think it's going to be much of much of a difference and i think it should be pretty it should work well uh, you know again scoring if how much scoring that bottom six is going to do i'm not sure but you know that's it's going to be interesting to see so who among um, the bottom six do you think poses the most upside in terms of scoring who do you think in 2022 of this lineup who who has the most upside there um i'm gonna say philip tomasino hmm. um i think he's doing a lot of things right he still has a lot of growth that he needs to do but he's looked very very competent coming in he's looked very strong like you don't see him getting lost on plays very often he's a, he's very responsive he's got the good vision and he's got the smarts to know and you know mind gaps things like that and so i think that he's due he had a pretty pretty good year by you know first year rookie standards um and so you know i think that he's that guy that could very well play himself into a line you know playing alongside johansson and niederreier you know depending on what goes on with ellie tolvin but i also am somebody who thought that ellie tolvin got a, you know was a better player last season than he has been and they ended up benching him towards the end of the season so what do i know <laughs> interesting yeah. what do you think charlie i mean for the most part when i looked at what you projected here i I had a hard time thinking of where I would make substitutions. And I, I don't think I, I would for the most part, because outside of that, that second, the second line, maybe. And you said that, like if Tomasino makes a, a push and he's able to get minutes there, but like, other, otherwise I, obviously this is a projection that Tolvanen will be what the coaches want him to be and, and hmm. he'll be able to get there. Cause that, that was weird at the end of the season, like you said, cause they, you just remember the hype around him coming in. Like everybody was like, Oh man, look at the, these shots, in the mm-hmm. KHL, like he's killing it. This is great. Get this man a contract right now. He came, then he come in in the playoffs and like, they tried to like mm-hmm. work him in at the very end of the season. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. And it just hasn't clicked yet. I, that that could end up being – if it could click, if you could get it to click for him or for Thomas C, I don't care who it needs to be. If you could get it to click in that Niederreiter Johansson X line, I mean, I think that could be really good. Uh, and, I, I mean, Niederreiter makes all the difference there. The changes so much because it was just such a struggle. And the third – like the fact that the third line in some games was like carrying the offense, <laughs> it's like that can't happen. You, that that can't be the case. Yeah. Um, and so I'm I'm happy that it's like three pretty legit lines now outside of that one spot where we're talking like there could sort of be substitutions. Otherwise, I mean, I just don't I don't have that much to to squabble with here. Like, uh, I guess I I could have seen Yossi McDonough. I otherwise and Carrier Ekholm. I I don't. But out like that's just all speculation. I don't know. And, and I honestly, I don't know that I know enough about like strategy to kind of be like, oh, well, McDonough plays this way and Yossi plays this way. So they don't actually like I'm not deep enough into hockey strategy to speak <laughs> to that as much. But I 
I do actually like compared to last year. I look at this and and I go specifically. I think the defense will be better with uh, with McDonough. Hopefully, Carrier keeps getting better. Um, Fabro needs to step it up. He's kind of kind of like Tolvanen, where you like the expectations are really high and it hasn't clicked totally yet. Um, like there's there's some things like that that I think if you get the growth you want to get and these guys fill in the way that you hope that they do it, it could be pretty good. But we talked about last week, like, is this, is this that cup lineup? Uh, no, mm. I don't think so. <laughs> not, not as it's yeah. currently constructed, but, uh, but I do, I, I like it more than a year ago. And that team took you to yeah the, the first round. Of they play. probably know that though, right? Like they f- don't feel like this is a cup team, right? Like if you gave some, some true serum to this front office, I think, they would right. say that like we're okay with where we're at we feel mm-hmm. like we're a playoff team but like we know that there is a ceiling with the with these lineups and with what we can do with these lines right uh, definitely i mean i think that you know they're, they're never going to be that realistic about it but i mean the other thing to look at though is you point at the playoff run during the cup year mm-hmm. you know and the sheer amount of injuries that they dealt with you know and that's when you had guys like freddie goudreau in there um, you know, they had come in like Goudreau famously did never had a um, didn't didn't have his own locker. So he had like a table and a chair. There's a picture of it. Uh, you know, it, it's great. Like for those moments, you know, you see guys kind of come out of nowhere. But you look back at those rosters for like the, the you know, in the Stanley Cup finals against the Penguin. And you're just looking at like, you know, there's like three or four players who played like more than 40 games in, in Milwaukee that season. And, and, you know, they did it all like Ryan Johansson was injured. Uh, Kevin Fiala was injured. Kevin Fiala was like like Wolverine basically because that he had to come back from a huge injury at, at that point. And so he wasn't even there for the cup finals, you know, and you think about like what that team could have done if healthy, if they could have kept up with with the the Penguins, you know, if the NHL wasn't out to give them the Stanley Cup that season because Colton Sissons 100 percent scored. But that's just me being that's objective. That has nothing to do with my biases. And uh <laughs> <laughs> so you know you see that though but Speaking you see a team like scored though uh we could we could go like that's a tennessee staple in, over the last couple of years we could uh like a certain jalen wright for instance may or may not have crossed the plane uh seven how many months ago was that now eight nine and i'm still angry like we're just oh, that's a I'm tennessee so staple about scissors, dude that's oh my yeah. gosh i yeah we should do like that's a whole thing like preds and vols like just uh the, should have been the venue matters in terms of how long i'm bitter for the <laughs> the music city bowl it's like okay i can get over that it's music city bowl but if that had happened in like the national championship like this was the stanley cup like i would be raging for you i still i mean i still am i, still, I would need a new tv you know? like if that had happened uh, in the national title even in just the sec t- or if it was a just like georgia or alabama like something like that i would just i I'd, or florida ugh. for that matter i don't know it would have been horrific but that's you know Sorry, that's we got we're at. There, Brian, no Brian, I, was, I was just trying to think about what mine i mean there's there's the 13 men on the field um there's mm-hmm. losing to wyoming um but is that your worst preds moment like is that the one that you're most frustrated by from the preds history yeah but i was also okay. bandwagoning at that point and it was my first year so i mean i it's think that, year. that's part of it um i was just trying to think of like you know in other sports what's comparable i think the closest thing for me is uh, Tony Romo in the in the in the playoffs when he when he mm-hmm. was still the holder from being the backup quarterback and it's a good one like that one that one kind of just broke me you know just in a way that I don't think I'll ever recover of Tennessee had broken me long before that um, you know but yeah I think that's probably the closest it kind of come to feeling like I did when they ruled against Colton Sissons in the in the Cup final the Tennessee baseball team this year losing to Notre Dame was pretty brutal in that's just- interesting. How like it it to- feels totally different because that predators it felt like you were coming behind from behind that whole time. I mean you weren't supposed. You were to be fool's there. gold. You were just happy to be. You're like wow, yeah. this is awesome. Who cares? And and then like game game seven against the Jets where they just murdered you in the most. I mean I said like the worst game seven in the history of hockey. Um, that pissed me off to no end. I would say that that's pretty similar to the Tennessee baseball team this season. Was that game seven against Winnipeg where you you won the President's Cup. And but it still felt like Winnipeg was like right there on your heels, but you were probably the better team. And you get to that game seven and just blow it sky high. Like that that's that's what that game against Notre Dame felt like with that baseball team, where you were just like you're you're obviously the better team, but you're just this whole thing's just been off. Like something's just not right. 
and it seemed like we didn't have a star player for one of those games. Oh yeah, well yeah, that was <laughs> a small factor. Two two mm-hmm. of those games. Uh, well yeah, I guess one of yeah, them. Yeah, almost two. Yeah, out for the next one. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I uh, just too many to count. Tennessee basketball is sure winning the SEC title and losing in the second round of the tournament. When does it ever end? When does the pain end? Oh, no. are, are you who's your NFL team there, Chase? I don't want to talk about it. I, no, I was gonna no, no, because I was just I, was I don't just want to talk thinking, about like, anything. Twenty eight three. We don't have to do that. We don't. I, I, I was staying. Yeah, do the Falcons thinking. have any? Do they have any painful moments in a championship? Thinking, I can't remember. I'm thinking. I, I, I'm coming up blank. I don't. I feel like there's one I'm forgetting. I don't know. <laughs> it seems so long ago, like like twenty eight weeks, twenty eight, you know, something like that on mo- twenty eight months, something. I don't know. Just, <laughs> there was a Eugene Robinson moment leading up to the Super Bowl in ninety eight that mm. uh, a lot of people may not even remember uh what happened there uh i was not uh aware at seven what the circumstances were involved in that uh that week and what uh, robinson may or may not have gotten into um and that be done and also the way people frame that super bowl with the broncos it wasn't as much of a beat as people made it seem like after the fact there have been far worse no um yeah i would say there there have been some moments like do we need to cite the specific atlanta falcons just horrific playoff moments of course not that's not what this podcast is about um the the braves the cardinals uh playoff game was probably the most frustrating i like i don't know if y'all remember we're the top of the first where the cardinals scored i think like 13 runs in the decisive nlds game and we like the whole day like people took off work we were all off work i had a lot of people over at our house we're getting ready to watch and then a baseball game ending in the first inning is just a different kind of feel. Cause like, even if you get off to a bad run in basketball or football and you're down 20, you're like, Hey, they're, they're still not out of it. Like they're still like, it's not great odds, but it's not over. You're down 13, nothing going into the, and you haven't even batted in a playoff game is just like, I, I I'll never forget sitting on my couch and just uh, but, dumbfounded. But I would almost rather that than So I no. No, Charlie, you don't want it. I promise. This is not well, something you on. want. Hold on. So I've I've always been a Rangers fan. I half my family lives in Forward, Texas. I I grew mm. up. I, I would stay at their house during the summer, and we would go to Rangers games when I was little. Um, so I've been a Rangers fan for a long time. 2011. You mentioned the Cardinals. The Rangers got down to the final strike for a World Series game mm. six. They win that game. They win the World Series. The final strike. <laughs> and freaking Nelson Cruz at the wall misses a catch that would have sealed the World Series. The World Series. <laughs> <laughs> and freaking Freeze gets up there on the next at bat and murders my hopes and dreams and anything I've ever loved. And that's mm. that is one where I just like it's it's a culmination where you look like the Titans. One outstretched arm away from a Super Bowl. Uh, the Rangers, one strike away from a World Series. Somehow, Tennessee football found a way to do it. I, I still am dumbfounded by that. In my lifetime, they did that. So there is that much. But, like, it just – when do, when does the pain end? When do we get to be the Alabama? When do we get to be the, the – Well, Red speaking Sox of, the, Roman Harper, whatever. everyone stop. I cannot take this anymore. Like if I see 10 and two now, like we're the, just the trendy 10 and two stuff. I'm going to lose it. I don't want this. I don't want these expectations. I I've said for the longest that this season either goes six and five and they take a step back in the wins department, or they do make that big jump because year two is actually a pretty big significant indicator of where a program's going to go. And it, it, no one ever thinks year two. It's like, Oh, it's still pretty early. No, you make the jump or you don't like there is a, there's a pretty big jump. I did a story on this where you go through it and most coaches break through in year two. That's every, really speaking where it is. Every active college football coach who has won a national championship won at least nine regular season games in their second year. Oh, there you go. That good, is good pull. I yeah, like that. That is, I, I just that always sticks with me because with Tennessee getting so many new coaches constantly, it's the thing <laughs> that I always go through that you have to rationalize at the end of the season. Like even I mean, Tennessee beat kirby smart which is still butch jones beat kirby smart which is so crazy but in that second year kirby got it together he won nine games yep and look where he is you know and so that's nine and three is doable but my whole thing is like i talk to me after september like i'll know where this program is and how many wins they'll have after september like if they sweep Pitt, florida 
nine, ten wins as possible and likely, honestly. You go I, a one and one, you lose both. Oof. Not that, fl- yeah. that Florida game just sets the sets the tone for the entire regular season, like the entire season. Speaking if you want to get like, some tickets, you might want to jump on that one. Like I'm we, already ill about that game. I just I'm like, it's going to be so. But ugh. see, I'm more ill about the pick game right now. I think people are really like Tennessee fans have just penciled that in as a win. I think we might not no. be favored going into pit. We'll be favored against Florida. I think th- it's just a weird dichotomy between the two of them right now where people pitt, are wrong about how they see pitt pitt's a better team than florida pitt will be the barometer where you go like can in these early season big games can tennessee hang i mean yeah you beat mm. Pitt. i think you'll be probably a touchdown favorite against florida depending on i guess i think florida has to play kentucky even before that yeah utah before that too oh yeah they've got a true. horrific september florida people has are like horrific. expecting them to get like stomped by utah which Probably is a fair Utah could be a play. They, they're like in the conversation for a playoff team this year. Like they yeah. very much could. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they got stomped. Um, but I mean, let's hope so. Six Speak- and six Florida this year. That would be awesome. That would be know, amazing. Please. I was going to say, speaking of, of tone setters for a season, I'm going to try to bring this back in. Cause I just thought about it. <laughs> yeah. We're going off. Yeah, that's your job, Brian. We, we were just all, we can, it's a gift. That I don't get, to, I don't talk Tennessee football much anymore. So it's always nice to just sit there, but then I'm like, Oh man, I'm just fanning out right now. Listening. Uh, I was going to say, I think December as it, when it gets to Christmas break, that, that last, you know, the last month, you know, the first half of the season, you know, Nashville's got a stretch of playing Tampa, then Ottawa, St. Louis, Edmonton is a back to back. Winnipeg, Colorado, Edmonton again, Chicago, Colorado again, Dallas, and then back to backs against Anaheim and Vegas. Like that yes. right there, when they get to that break, when they get to the, the holiday break, that that should tell you what this team is kind of capable of. Because again, Edmonton has, I think they've got like a six game winning streak against Nashville right now. Because hmm. uh, Leon Dreisaitl just gets four or five points and three goals every single time he plays against the Predators. He's just an unreal. I've seen it in person twice now, and I don't understand how he does it. Uh, you know, guys like you've got when Winnipeg's are always tough when there's Colorado, you know, it's Colorado, you know, what to expect with them, you know, Dallas and Winnipeg and Chicago, you know, Chicago is going to be an absolute dumpster fire. And it warms my heart to see uh, <laughs> couldn't have happened to a better franchise um, and organization. Um, but, it, you know, that's probably going to be, you know, what you're going to see this team come out and what they're going to be made of because you get to March, March, they're playing with the exception of one Sunday in March. They are playing games on every Saturday and Sunday in that month. So they have back. They have three straight. No, one, two, yeah, three straight weekends of back to backs in in March as during the playoff push. So, I mean, that's and both all those almost all of them. Only one of them is a both at oh you know they're both traveling for. It's usually a home away split for both of those. And so like to go and do that and play a game at like. 12 o'clock or one or not even that like maybe four o'clock or something and then the next day playing another one 24 hours and you know being on the plane in between you know you got to be ready and i think we'll know if the team's ready for that if they can come out of december over 500 you know what i hate from the last few years was that st louis team that won the cup because they i I remember the wasn't it that they had a losing record yes at at the christmas break People were like, "Oh, you can change coaches." Yeah, y- you can do it. All it doesn't matter. Oh, we have a losing record at the break. Well, St. Louis won that cup, remember? And but, mm-hmm. but that think, was a rarity. I think like they, they did, did that <laughs> because it gives it gives you false hope at that turn where you're like, "Oh, we have a losing record at the break. Maybe we could turn around." No, you can't. No, you can't. You're not going to turn around. They did, they did. The reason it's a talking point is because it was a miracle. The reason because it was a complete outlier. They ended up finding a free goalie that you know was just standing on his head in every single game he played in like it was just shout out to jordan bennington yeah dude he friggin went off at the end of that season and like it was it was just a freak thing and i hate that they did that because it makes that talking point anytime you have to like mention that but to be like well it looks like we suck but yeah well Well, we don't suck in the final half of the season you know you, you you bring up a very good point though because you know you think about a team where they 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 struggled to get into the playoffs. They had a bad record at, at midseason, not a great record at midseason. They struggled and were the last team to get into the playoffs. And but they had a goaltender that stood on his head and became otherworldly for the postseason. That's what happened in Nashville, you know. And so yeah, it's it's one of those where like if you're gonna be a team like this, if you're gonna be a team built as the Predators are currently constructed, 
it's you're going to need UC Soros to be that guy when it comes down to it because the team is not built to be a average four goals a game. They're not. They're just not that, you know, even last season with, you know, two 40 goal scorers for the first time in history, they're not a four goal a game team. If you get UC Soros and you keep him healthy enough, who knows what can happen? Just ha having a good, solid goaltender in the playoffs is one of the biggest things. And it's it's funny because it's just like, you know, last Toronto, you know, they 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 just can't do it. And it's because they've had a long, you know, a long history of just abandoning their goaltending position. And now look at them. So they're the funny one of the funniest things in all of sports is is the Maple Leafs. And I I get it. And I also don't get it because we're so disconnected from Canada. Like they're right there. But like, I don't I don't even know the last time I even spoke to a Canadian person like <laughs> I have in my life at certain points, but like, I don't even know. But the that whole thing, outside looking in, like the fishbowl of the Toronto Maple Leafs and just, you know, we we're talking about sports torture, man. I mean, what is it now, however long since they've won a series? It's uh, a long, long time. Yeah. Like Canadian, I don't think a Canadian team has won the, won the cup in a long, long time. I mean, I, I, yeah. I like to joke with some of my friends that are up in Toronto and, and stuff, and I, I'll tell them, be like, you know, one day you guys up there in Canada, you know, you're going to develop and grow the game and you're going to be kind of a hockey hotbed. Like we are here in the South with like Tampa and Nashville and St. Louis and stuff. And they, it, they, they know I'm messing with them and it gets them a little bit fired up, but they're just like, I'm not going to entertain this. Like, it's like, look, y'all can't be Nashville and that's okay. You know, but it's so funny. <laughs> that's and, great. <laughs> yeah. Talking to Canadians is it's just as, you know, the stereotype of them being nice. That's how it is. And they all think, Oh my God, you have an awesome accent. I'm like, uh, really? <laughs> but that's that's how i feel when like somebody like uh i'm trying to think like who like uh, almost ohio state although ohio state's pretty legit i just but a team that's like outside of the south where they like get a little too big for their britches and they're talking like oh college football blah 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 blah, blah. i go okay calm down you, you know Look, you're playing in the kids' league over there in the Pac-12 and in, in the Big 12, whatever you're doing. You know, let don't don't get to, too high and mighty. Come over and play in the SEC. We'll see how you do. You know, and that's I feel like that's how Canadians feel when we talk anything like that. Where we're just like, well, hockey's so great, and they're like, mm, we created this sport. How about you? You take a seat, champ. That's uh, I don't know. There you uh, go. I I understand their their frustration. Charlie Burris, yeah. what can the good folks check out from you this week at A to Z Sports? Dude, college football is like so close. It makes me, I'm anxious, honestly. Um, but uh, the Big Orange Podcast. Yes. Uh, starting, I got to think, not this week, but the next week, we're going to start doing them live stream. They're going to be live, mm. the podcast on Mondays. Wow. Uh, I think the plan is it's going to be noon on Mondays mm -hmm. um, going forward through the football season. Uh, so the Big Orange Podcast, A to Z Sports dot com, uh, and the uh, Big Orange Game Day Show with myself and Jonathan Crompton on Tennessee Football Game Days, and then you can find me on Twitter at Charlie underscore Burris. When the Predators play, I will be rage tweeting about how mad I am, and you can find me there. <laughs> there you go, Brian. What about you on the four check? Uh, What's going on this week? Oh uh, yeah, so uh, we're get, we're kind of working through the doldrums of of getting ready to do previews and things like that. Still waiting to see if there's any more moves. So, you know, all that, like you said, rage tweeting uh, about the Preds, you know, turned into a, a paid, a paid gig. So, you know, keep at it. You know, it's always, it's always good. That's that if you're out there rage tweeting, someone's listening, I guess. Um, also we're, we're gearing up to with uh, the Renegades of Puck uh, headed up, you know, by Ch uh, Charlie Sonye. You know, we, we've got this on YouTube on podcast form as well. Uh, you know, our regular season schedule is, is, the night the night of after every game you know we have instant reaction feedback i'm usually recording at bridgestone arena after the game's over and so make sure you're getting on that it makes excellent excellent listening for your drive in uh you know for those of us who still have to go to an office you know it's it's def you know great commute stuff so make sure you check that out too and uh you know we're gonna have some big events here in nashville when to kick se the season off with renegades so make sure you check that out and you know find them on renegades of puck at uh, on twitter there you go Brian, Charlie, thank you as always, and I will talk to y'all next week. Thanks a lot. See